the Matt Lersey Project. This is a show about all things real estate, business, marketing, and entrepreneurship. Each show consists of myself, Matt Lersey, and a member of my team, and a guest. This week, the Matt Lersey Group team member joining us is none other than Mr. Mickey Hobson. Hi, Mickey. Good morning. Do, do Mickey, do, how many people call you think your name's Nikki instead of Mickey? Two out of ten. Two out of ten. Because yeah. it happens to me all the time. You know, I got that name when I, when I first came to the States. What was it before? No one called me that in, in South Africa. I actually do not know this. What yeah. did they call you? They called me Mike Hobo Hobo. Mike? Maybe I'll call and you Mike. I, I was at a party huh. in, in college and someone just randomly called me Mickey. And then everyone started calling me Mickey. Huh. Because every time I say you're meeting Mickey, they're like, Nikki? And like, no, M-I-C-K-E-Y. And like, lot, oh, yeah, like a Mickey a Mouse. Lot, a lot of people do think <laughs> I'm a, a girl. Yeah. Yeah. The Mickey Mouse thing is yeah. hard because you're... That's what I say. Sometimes that's Mickey Mouse. I kind of like going with And you're like, where are my ears? <laughs> <laughs> I like saying Nikki, though. Sometimes I think they're meeting a Nikki, but it's actually Mickey. But yeah. Okay, anyways. So uh, this month's, or this week's guest is uh, one of my favorite people in the world, Miss Erin Mendel from App Properties. And episode 10 is called Collaboration is Better Than Competition. Erin, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. Can you give us maybe a, a quick two-minute background of yourself? Sure. Um, so I was born in De- on December 3rd. Okay. You like pizza? Got it. Um, yep. Sagittarius long walks on the beach. Okay. Sarah McLaughlin. Just kidding about the Sarah McLaughlin piece. Um, I've been in real estate since 2005. I had a long career with the Belgravia group, uh, a lot of background in pre and new construction. Um, I came over to at properties in 2009. I've had a brokerage ever since. And um, and here we are. Here we are. So I know Aaron, Aaron we were talking about this early. We first met at uh, YPN, which at the time was called Young Professional Network. That's true. Which is uh, an organization and we encourage any other realtors that are listening to get involved because it's how you get to meet other people and then it's it's even like mickey when you you know aaron now from us meeting it's mm. it makes things more comfortable on showings and things of that nature right yeah, for sure. uh and if you're on negotiating deals and stuff like that and that's why i believe like if you collaborate with other agents it makes things a little bit better but we also would uh see each other at dbg so we were part of ypn but dbg was david barton gym that was really the place where we would like sweat it out, right. really kind of talk about our deals, what's challenging, like is it the front of the deal, the end of the deal, Correct. inspection, those yeah. types of things. And Erin was, um, uh, she could afford a trainer at the time and, uh, <laughs> because I didn't have any money. I would have to enviously like drool that she got somebody to, like really like work her out and I was there like trying to like lifting weights. Well, like one like, could argue that I actually needed someone to help me work yeah. out and you were just naturally correct. So, so what I would do is when she wasn't looking is I would hear she was uh, in a multiple bid so I'd throw on extra weights to make it heavier so <laughs> then I could get the, the, the property <laughs> instead of her. So, but, um, so, you know, Aaron, I, you know, what did you do before you got in real estate? Because you said you got in in 2005. What were you doing prior to getting involved with real estate? So I come from a real estate family, and I tried to get as far away from real estate as possible. I thought, you know, I'm a creative. I went to the journalism school. I have a marketing background, and I... What do you big... mean you came from a family? Like, who, who, who was so involved? So I'm from, I'm from Milwaukee, and my father is a developer in Milwaukee. Wow. So I would say that I knew about stick construction, planning communities, TIFF, uh, dollars, um, aldermen, and all those types of words before I probably knew how to play with a Barbie doll. Okay. It's just kind of like in my veins. So, so you're building doll houses. I mean, maybe not doll houses, maybe like more effective houses, solar panels, those types of things. Oh, wow. Okay. So she was, this is super advanced. You know what I'm talking about? I yeah. mean, I just like, yeah. it was maybe a little bit of ahead of my time. Yeah, in that absolutely. Way. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I went to the journalism school. I really liked music. I was on the music committee for University of Wisconsin. And when everybody was partying and going to sorority and fraternity parties, I was like booking shows for the union in Union South. And uh, I just really loved it. And I received an internship and an opportunity to go work for Universal Records. And so I moved to LA and they moved me to Paris and I would translate French interviewers with artists. Wow. So you can actually speak French. Oui, moi je parle français, j'ai commencé mes études. Where did wow. you learn that? Uh, I started in school when I was like in third or fourth grade. And then during the summers, um, I would go and live with French families. Huh. Um, the thing is, is that I think they were looking for a full-time babysitter. Uh, um, and they would like invite me into their home, offer me Nutella, and then say, stay with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually genius. So I actually love Paris, but I can't speak any. Fr- wee wee is about as much as I know. Okay. Well, you know, what, what is wine? Do you uh, know what wine is? What? Vina. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, or vin. Yeah. Uh, Beau de vin. 
for the event. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I could read them. I could read the wine. And what's your and favorite wine region? Bordeaux. Right. So yeah. See, we got. Yeah. Where I mean, we're I, going. I got, I'm pretty much speaking French right now, but Do yes. Do you know how to say like where is the bathroom? Uh, no. Like où est le WC? Où est le WC? Mm -hmm. yeah. See, we're the same. We're, we're, yeah. we're getting further. Yeah. We're getting further. So you're you're. Wait, so how did you like L.A. compared to then Chicago? So L.A. was like the best thing ever. The, the funniest part is that I was 20 when I was working for Universal. So wow. I couldn't get into any of the bars or any of the restaurants. And so they'd say, hey, we're going to do this like pre-show for Bubba Sparks or do this show for Eminem or do this show for Maroon 5. And they'd say, you can come from like 3 to like 7. And then when the bar opens, you have to go Literally. home. Wow, <laughs> so that's terrible. So, so what made you pivot then? From this LA, I mean that that had been a pretty badass lifestyle. I like know, to because you were probably were you around like a lot of famous artists and I stuff like that. I was around a lot of famous artists, and I think the first thing I learned on my first day was that everybody puts their pants on the same way, right? And that's something that I Got carry it. through even yeah. into brokerage, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of ego in our business, yeah. and I think, hey, we're all here to get to a common goal, which sure. is to get to the closing table. In the music business, it was ultimately that music is my biggest passion, and it's like my favorite thing to do, and to see the underbelly of the business world of uh, music just kind of broke my heart. Would you say that you that some brokers have bigger egos than some famous musicians that you've uh, met? Is this on the I record? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so so you met these guys. You, you didn't like uh, maybe seeing some of like the music industry, and is that what made you pivot going from L.A. to come to Chicago, or how did, that, how did going from L.A. to Chicago happen? I knew that if music was to remain my biggest passion and that was going to be the thing I would enjoy the most, that I would go and do something that would create an opportunity where I could buy the front row seat at every concert because that was the thing I wanted the most. And what's the favorite concert you could go to if you could? Like, who's your favorite uh, artist? Matt, this is an impossible question. Okay. What's the best one you, you may... To? You may not know this, but I have a very significant vinyl collection. Huh. I did not know that. I like to listen to music on vinyl old school. Okay. And there's a difference in the way that sounds, oh, I'm assuming? Oh, yes. Okay. In this digital world, it's a sad, sad world for okay. me. I like so to him. just go on Spotify oh, and find Oh, you're killing me, yeah. brother. Killing okay. me. Okay. So, um, so you decided to go from there. What made you choose Chicago and then going back to Milwaukee? So Chicago was an opportunity for me to become my own gal. Um, my father was a notable developer in Milwaukee, and okay. I thought, if I had an opportunity to become my own person, that I would come to Chicago and really make it on my own. So what was your first job when you came to Chicago? My first job in Chicago, I worked for a mortgage company called 21st Century Mortgage Bankers in Westmont, Illinois. Okay. I, I do, are they still around? They are so, not yeah. still around. Okay. No, no. So you personally bankrupted that company. Um, I personally <laughs> yeah. knew yeah. that yeah. when we were talking about FICO scores and the numbers were in the 500s, I probably wasn't in the right business. So, so what made you go from uh, 21st century, whatever that was, to getting your broker's license and selling properties? So I, um, I met with LaSalle Bank. Uh, I met with someone at LaSalle. LaSalle Bank. Remember, yeah, LaSalle, LaSalle Bank was like a big bank. Okay, so like you're a boss if you worked at LaSalle those Bank. Big, big yeah. players there. And I met with a banker, and he had done some financing for some developments that I knew. And he said, if you're going to meet and work with any developer in Chicago, it's Buzz Ruttenberg. He's the best developer. They have a boutique firm. He does great work. He's really helping to revitalize certain neighborhoods, and he builds a great product. You should go and talk to him. So you started, uh, and so Buzz is a very prominent uh, developer here in Chicago. He builds a lot of stuff. He has built Gravia, uh, real estate. and They're building right across the street from you. Yeah, directly <laughs> across the street from our office. <laughs> uh, personally a big fan of, of his work. Um, was it called Bill Gravia at that time? It was called Bill Gravia. Okay. And so I cold called him actually. Just out of the blue. You just picked up the call I, like, hey, I, this is E. I said, I didn't say did hey, it's E. No, I was a little more formal. I okay. said, hi, my name is Aaron Mandel. Breck Hansen from LaSalle Bank shared with me that if I'm going to learn from anybody, it's going to be you. And he said, well, we don't really have any availability right now, but you know what? You sound like you're hungry and you're knowledgeable and you really want to learn. I will mentor you. What? Wow. So on like Mondays at seven o'clock because if you remember I was working in Westmont. Oh yeah. So I would leave the office at like say five thirty. It'd take right. me an hour and a half to get back into the city. He'd meet me at seven o'clock on a Monday, maybe once a quarter, and we'd talk about some of the development he was doing, particularly in like the River West area, because it was kind of uncharted territory at the right. time. So what they do such a good job of is finding a neighborhood, finding a niche and then, you know, filling the Real void in which yeah. 
So how did you then go from the mentorship to uh, selling for him? So it was about a year. Okay. Uh, we met for, I don't know, maybe a handful of times. And he mm-hmm. said, um, are you ready to come interview? And I said, just so long as you don't tell the sales manager that you and I have a relationship. Okay. And he said, okay. Okay. So I showed up at 7 o'clock again on a Monday because I had my obligations with my work. And um, I met with the sales manager. Well, the first, I drove into the lot. I was chewing gum. And Buzz said, got to get the gum out of your mouth. Okay. It's not professional. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, and go knock him dead. So I walked in. I was so nervous. And I met with, uh, at the time, uh, the sales manager was Corey Robertson. Okay. Uh, he had a lot of experience in new home sales, um, just nationwide. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, we're going to offer you a great opportunity. We have a new development coming to market. It's a rehab. Um, it's 72 units for a $22 million sellout in East Lincoln Park. The development was 2300 Commonwealth. And we're going to give you an opportunity and pay you like a rookie. And I said, great, let's go. That's and good. you took it and ran with it. I took w- it and w- ran with it. What does pay it like a rookie mean? It meant that I was deserving of not a veteran split. So they would give me an opportunity yeah. to uh, receive a commission. And at the time, the structure was wonderful because it didn't matter who made the sale. Both agents got paid. So what's a um, so <clears throat> for people out there that like talk about new development stuff like that. So what what would be a traditional if you work at like a big company like Ad or whatever that you would get off of development? Like what's a what's a veteran and what's a rookie split? Like is that like so? I don't think at properties like, sell or at properties doesn't have like a, a rhythm like, to it. Like I think a it, set. I think it. Depends what, what would on, be the general like? I think you can make regular commission, you know, that we would take on brokerage. Okay. I think it just kind of varies on the sellout, the marketing dollars, and who's paying for X, Y, or Z. So there's no, and not that we're price fixed, I just didn't know if there's like a, de- a general development for big high rises. I think there's no you. like particular rule. I mean, I've worked for several developers and I've finished a lot of new construction, especially after the dislocation of the market. I came in to finish Sono. I went to come and finish the legacy and the structures were all just completely different based on, you know, what the bank required, what the mes debt required, Required and what the developer needed at the time. How many how many developments do you think you've done now? More, more than more than two. More than thirty. More than thirty. Okay, so that's quite a bit. Do you like doing the new constructions more than like traditional sales? So I haven't done a development in some time. Uh, the legacy was the last sellout I did, and that was in. Which is 20, a wash construction. Right. It was 60 East Monroe, 355 units. It's the largest residential building actually in the nation because there is no mixed use. There's no retail space in that entire building. Got and it. it was a brilliant deal, right? In yeah. theory, they had no Michigan Avenue uh spot available so what they did is purchase the air rights above the art institute school right did, gave the monroe an entrance and really uh you have a michigan avenue presence it's a beautiful building it is mm-hmm. yeah it's yeah. gorgeous and it's it's really held its value so like working there and then going traditional um do you think you want to stick more in the traditional or do you think you want to get back to new de- new development so i like the mix i think there really hasn't been an opportunity for new build and you know we obviously have seen a lot of cranes in the sky more than uh, in I've the seen last before. four years, mm-hmm. we have a lot of new build. Um, I have, you know, had one development in the last couple of years that I've really taken um, great care of. Kit gloves, if, if you know, you can say. And that's the the townhouse project you got going on now. It's actually single level living homes. They're thirty foot wide interiors. They're eight homes um, in East Lincoln Park. So homes, not not townhomes. No you get that right, Mickey? We can't there, We can't say this wrong. Well, a townhome would be essentially a freestanding. Correct. Okay, so these are single-level living. Top. Right. Okay. Um, so getting into new development, how did you pivot from Belgravia to at properties? So when the market started to get difficult in that 2006 time period. Shift, right? Oh, well, let's call it a dislocation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A wake-up call. Yeah. Um, we had a or a market correction. How about that? Yeah. Does yeah. that sound well, sophisticated? Well, really, the ne- necessary fault. market correction. Yeah. Oh, okay. No. Oh, that was <laughs> yeah. really good, Mickey. Yeah. Mickey, yeah. Mickey, I watched a lot of Mickey, CNBC. Mickey. Ah, <laughs> yeah. CNBC. Okay. He, and when he says it, though, it sounds so like proper. You I mean, know what I mean? You really do. I I'm like, know. oh yeah, that sounds right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You believe me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so App Properties actually came in during that time to share the sales and marketing efforts with us. Yeah. Uh, two agents came in, um, and they actually are some of my best friends to date. Um, and I said that I would not leave Belgravia until we were 
finished selling that property. I thought that Buzz gave me the opportunity to come into the Chicago market. He taught right. me everything I knew, and I really wanted an opportunity to finish that project. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I went over to at Properties. Was that a tough pivot for you to make to leave Belgrave to go to at? No. I just, it was the first time, actually, this is a funny thing that I realized. So brokers would make these appointments in my sales center at like 120, 310, 455, and I'd be like, this is so weird. Right. Like, why don't you just make the appointment for 5 o'clock? Right. And I didn't know that in brokerage, you know, we have to clock 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here. We have to think about driving time, parking, all those types of Traffic, things. Traffic, yeah. You know, I just didn't know because I was in a sales center from 10 to 6. Yeah. So what was, the, what was the, probably the hardest thing going from the, uh, you know, development mode to going to now uh, traditional route? So I think the hardest thing is going to be the opposite of what most people would say, but I think something you can totally appreciate, Matt, is that I don't know how to turn it off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm working all the time. If I thought I worked uh, hours at Belgravia, I would say now... If I'm up at six and sleeping by midnight, especially in the fast-paced market, that's a pretty good day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen, six hours of sleep is great. I so, mean, what do you average? Four. Four. I'm a four hours guy. You're a four hour I'm, guy. I'm usually one thirty to five thirty is typically what I sleep. Sometimes it's you know more or less like hour wise, but it's usually in that route. So, in fact, the other day on New Year's Eve, I, I did not make it till midnight. Uh, I, I fell asleep at eleven, and I woke up at eight the next day. So I got like nine hours of sleep. Did you not know what to do with yourself? I was so cranky New Year's Day from getting so much sleep because Mm -hmm. I kept complaining about all the hours. And Nicole was just like, will you shut up? Like you literally slept like pretty much normal hours for (laughs) once. And I was like, I just feel like such like a waste of time. So it's just, it's messed up how our brains work with that. So, so anyways, getting back to this. So you get started and like, would you say, what would you say is the best advice for somebody getting into the business then? Because for you, it was finding a, a, a mentor. Is finding a mentor the best advice? Or how, how would you say somebody should get started in the business? So I would say education is key, right? I think a, uh, a wild thing about our business is that mm-hmm. I think outside looking in, especially given all the TV shows that are available to us on our favorite networks, right. like Bravo, right. um, that everyone thinks that it's so easy to do what we do, right? It does we look show like up that. in a suit. Yeah. We say our seller won't go any lower. We go out for a nice $100 meal. We walk around the block a little bit, get into our Maserati, and we say, oh, we just made $300,000. Right, and then the commission I mean, comes up like $150,000. And they're like 6% made. made, and then they everyone thinks that that's what we get. Right, right, right. And so I would say, you know, look. Um, the art of the deal is something that's really special. Paying attention to the details is really special. Being able to cooperate with brokers is really special. Right. And I think that you have to humble yourself, right? Right. Because this is generally speaking the largest financial transaction that any human will ever mm. make. Right. And sometimes it's their first. Yeah. And as we know, because we deal a lot with the move up buyer, right? Yeah. That the people that come and buy their first home from you, they need all the equity in that existing structure to move up. And generally when they're moving up, We've got some other things going on. Maybe they're expecting. Yeah. Um, maybe you know they're moving from the city to the suburbs, and those are all stressful points. It's a very emotional process, and I think you know a lot of people forget that we're in customer service, and that's something I tell my guys all the time: is we are in customer service. These, I don't care how much you made off commission last year, and these people are only buying X amount. Like the reality is, is those people, your clients, they're your boss. And if they tell you to jump, you say how high. That's the way I operate. At least. I agree. And I think a lot of people forget that because they see these TV shows and their mind gets warped that they are like this semi-famous person. They forget that like, hey, we are just normal people who have a job that if you do well, you could do well. But if they forget that, and that's where I think some of the ego comes into play because it is sales and people are constantly trying to outdo each other. And they forget that like at the end of the day, we're all on the same page. And that's kind of like why I say like, you know, collaboration is, is better than, than competition. And it's kind of like you're with App Properties mm-hmm. and I'm supposed to hate you and you're supposed to hate me because we're, we're technically oh, oh, rivals. We're competitors. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, everybody's supposed to, and, and, you know, there's a lot of people, and not you, not me, but there's a lot of people out there that badmouth other brokers to get business and they think that's the way, it, you know, to get it done. And at the end of the day, I think the general, and I'm not saying, I'm sure some sellers and buyers out there like that, but the general person wants... They don't want to hear somebody throw something on the bus to get business. They want to hear that people work well together mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, you need both parties 
So it's interesting, you know, what we've we've come off like four or five years of like a significant seller's market, right? Correct. Yeah. Where there's been limited inventory and we have five, six, maybe sometimes the most I've ever had on one listing is maybe thirty offers on one deal. Sure. That's and crazy. It's probably that like three fifty to five fifty price range. Yeah. Right. That more, we call them entry so in Chicago we call them entry level. Things on I would even say like, you know, six hundred to and under is going to be like your really what a, you know more liquid properties, meaning they'll move quicker. So five thirty offers, and let's say the price and terms are all correct. Okay, correct. so we have escalation clauses on every on every deal. Everybody's right. willing to do highest and best thousand thousand dollars above the next highest price. And an escalation clause for everybody out there is, is somebody adding a rider onto a contract saying they'll go X more than X price, pretty much. Okay, so then they all are giving say twenty percent. Right. They're all using a local bank. Right. Okay. All the price and terms are great. Maybe some people are waiving inspection. Some people are waving, waving appraisal. And at the end of the day, you look at all the people who are representing all those buyers. Right. And it would be ill-informed to not think that a broker doesn't look at who's going to cooperate with you on that deal. And if all it's apples to apples to apples and the money makes sense for your seller and you've informed them on all that, you're generally going to want to work with the person who you know is going to cooperate with you to its fullest yep. to get to the end of the deal in a thoughtful and educated manner to make sure that it's fair and equitable for both parties and that everybody remembers that at the end of the day, we're just agents. Correct. And it's I, I like to say that a lot. Like, There's a lot of intangibles in play. Like Mickey, when you first came on too, I said like you want to try to get to know as many brokers as possible yeah. you know, and go to events and stuff like that because if you know out of those 30 people that you know, like 10 of them just started uh, and the other 10 are just like really difficult to work with and now you're down to like maybe two two are the same and one guy definitely closes all the deals is super easy to work with and the other person is like you just know it's a nightmare you're probably going to choose the one that is an easier road because all the terms are the same so you have to look at intangibles what's going to make the process easier for my seller and a lot of brokers forget that we all need to be on the same page to get to the closing. And probably I'd say some of the most difficult problems with a transaction is when, when people's egos get in the way or they try to be what I call Superman, where they want to prove their value by trying to overcompensate and make things a little bit more difficult than they have to be. And then that's when egos get involved and then uh, people get a little bit more emotional. Well, and you know, it's so funny because I obviously I shared that I worked at the Belgravia group for quite some time and now I'm on the buy side for a lot of these deals. And someone will show one of those listings and they'll say, well, this is, this was a Belgravia upgrade level 12. And I think to myself, hmm. What's a level 12? I don't even know what that is. I think we had four options. Okay. I'm not sure if we had 12. But I'm going to let you do your thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not really like a material or latent stretch. So, right. um, you know, I'm a, you do your thing, girl. <laughs> right. And if my client likes it, we can talk about whether, you know, this white quartz was really an a, upgrade a level 12. 12. <laughs> I'm going to use that. <laughs> I'm going to use that. What is a level 12? Yeah, what is a level 12? I mean, I have no yeah. idea. Because these speakers I mean, only go to 10. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do these go to 12? <laughs> like, like, It was probably one of the more funny things, you know, in the inner okay. workings of, you know, the back end of a development. Right. And then you hear a broker kind of, yeah. you know. But I, I'd probably say one of the biggest things, though, is like, um, and, and I think people who first get into the business do this more than the people who've been around for a while. Because, like, it's kind of like if you've been around for a while and you do a high volume and you you're got an offer from another high volume person – it's kind of like you, you've you probably done deals, so you kind of know the personality. So, like, there's some things I'll change. I'm sure some people change things with me, you know I mean? And it just makes it so smooth, but it's the new ones that come in. So, to me, one of the things I always try to tell new agents is, you know, first off, check yourself. And, and second, like, if you don't know an answer, instead of, like, trying to ruin the deal over it, like, nobody's going to look. I never look down on people if they ask me, like, hey, I didn't know. I don't know this, but my clients ask me this. Like, can you, can you let me know? And then a lot of times, instead of them asking that, they'll, like, come at you. Uh, trying to make it more difficult to try to overcompensate because they didn't know something. Right. And um, well, you know. that's getting back to education, right? Correct. Education exactly. is key. And I think you know, for you know, I think you and I were both really diligent in making mm -hmm. sure that we understood X, Y, and Z before yeah. we really came up in this business together. We've known each other such a long time it's now. Been, yeah, it's been quite some time. Been through a and lot of life and a lot of real estate together. It, it has been. <laughs> and, and and I think I think it comes down to two accountability, like. Um, People, I, I think it's because social media has gotten so big and we're so into like the likes and stuff like that. But like, I mess up all the time. I mean, I'm a human being. I'm going to make mistakes. But one of the things that I always do is if I, if I mess up, 
on a deal or with a client. Like if it's a deal, I'm going to pay for it. Like I mess up this, here's what it costs. So I'm going to take it off my money. And, and I always say, if you mess up and you say, Hey, and you tell the other agent, like, Hey, I missed this. It's my fault. I'm sorry. It costs this much. So let's just remove it off that. It's so much harder for you to stay mad at that person. Cause you're like, Oh, well he's human or she's they human. It, yeah. Right. Mm. But so I many- think that that's, but I think that that's what separates you from the rest of the agents. Right. Like I just, I had a small, I had a deal at uh, 600 Lakeshore Drive, a long time mm-hmm. client of mine. He's selling his property. I know the buyer's agent really well. We actually both worked uh, for the developer together. We're both in brokerage. Right. And her client thought that the stools, personal property, which Correct. we all know is a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, that I love stools negotiating furniture. We're going to yeah. be included in the price. Mm-hmm. And my seller said, no, the stools are coming with me. Yeah. So now I'm looking on a you know sizable deal, and I'm thinking the stools were probably a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. And uh, the big picture of this is, you know what? No worries, my peeps. I'm gonna get the stools. Yeah. I'm gonna pay for the stools. Correct. And we're gonna move forward mm-hmm. towards just the just table. go through this. And and that's that's a big thing though is like, you know, for people who are getting started and 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 realizing that like you're with that property, so I can't be friends with you, or you're with Compass or Berkshire, or whoever it is, that you could still be friends with other people if you're not on the same quote-unquote team. I get it that you have to represent uh, your clients, and I'm all for that. I mean, listen, I've, I've had my moments more than I probably should, but the reality is is that uh, working together will always get you farther in this business because at the end of the day, it is a small business. Like, you're going to see those people over and over and over again if they do. And a truth large be told, volume. the top 1% is, uh, you know, that you're always seeing each other because you're really sharing that whole market space together. The top 200 agents pretty much do almost all the business. I mean, there's 42,000 plus agents. I mean, the top 200 are almost doing all of them. And truth be told, when you get a new agent on the other side of the deal and maybe they're, you know, a bit nervous to get through some piece of the transaction, like right now, I think you, you might agree with me yeah. that the the market shifting right so yep. we're seeing that buyers are starting to take more control of of the marketplace Correct. and there's a little bit of a disconnect between what sellers can sell their home for and what buyers are willing to pay so by the time we get to the inspection that buyers are starting to come up with these laundry lists of issues oh yeah because at point of contract, they might have agreed on a number, but when we come to inspection, they're thinking, I've overpaid yeah. for the price, so the right. carpet that you installed last year, even though it's brand new, I don't like it. Yeah. And maybe that's not a latent or material defect, but we have an issue here. Right. So I think setting the expectation for buyers and sellers is going to be one of our bigger challenges this year, and I think the more we can work together to amicably get to a resolution, the better. Yeah, I think expectation setting is probably one of the biggest things you could do out there to try to... Uh, make a deal be easier because the, the reality is, is most buyers and sellers, they, they may have done a couple transactions tops, but a lot of them are going to be first time going into the shifting market. And if you let them know exactly what can happen when it does happen, it's not like they've heard it for the first time. And I think, especially like when you're talking inspection or things like that is, you know, if you set that expectation up front, that there's gonna be 20 things wrong with every single property in the world and they get it back. They're not as kind of blindsided, but if these people don't know, and I, and I, that's why sometimes I don't get as mad if I get stuff like that because. Do you know who is the hardest on, it, on inspection on a deal? Uh, do you know who the hardest broker is? I I, I don't want to know this answer. No. You. <laughs> I do. I do. You are but, by far the toughest broker on the other side of a deal. I gotta represent. My <laughs> but the thing you is, you know what? Like, but let the truth rep- be told. Yeah. That I say to my seller, I know the buyer's agent. We know each other personally. Yeah. We know each other professionally. Correct. He is a tough guy to work with. <laughs> when inspection goes awry, you better make sure that we know what we're talking about. And we try. <laughs> what we try to do is educate people as much as possible and try to make the process as easy as possible. And like with that being said, like, do you feel uh, for brokers out there, like when they're choosing companies, and you know, right now, uh, Compass is the big talk of the town. Uh, you know, like like who you work for, like a Berkshire or a Compass or like app, like you, you love app properties. You think um, like who you work for matters as much as it did in the past? So for me, I love Mike and Thad. I think Mike and Thad built a, a business from being brokers, Yeah. right? So And for the uh, record, I think they're both amazing. A parallel, I think they've though, built an unbelievable product. A parallel here for me to you, right? Yeah. And you owning, being a business owner and having a nice sized team and being such a 
great producer in this community, Mike and Thad, sold property for so many years. They mm-hmm. know what it's like to be on the ground. Yeah. They know what the transaction is. And so for them to start a company from the ground up, full well knowing what it feels like to be in the field, right. to me, they were able to build a back end that really helps my business come along. The systems are just terrific. Right. And so do I think it matters what house you work with? I think it matters how well you're able to cater to your clients based on the fact that you have a great opportunity to, and quite frankly, the culture for me, it works. I, I say that. I say that you have to find a place because a lot of people think that big uh, companies are going to go away. Uh, that's the big uh, talk you read about um, is that there's going to be um, not as – people aren't going to be working for big brokers anymore. And I actually – even being a small guy, I disagree because I think the average agent is going to want to go to a big company regardless because it is it is more of a safer option. But at the end of the day, uh, it takes a lot less liability off your plate uh, and you have a little bit more of mentors. And on top of it all is it's – it helps represent your culture and all the back end stuff and all that stuff for people who are trying to start these smaller real estate companies is it's it is a lot of money, right. time and effort. You have a to lot get of overhead. That. Correct. You know, insurance, you gotta well, that's rent, what I'm saying, brick is and it's, mortar, all those types of things. I, I disagree. But I give you so, so yeah. much credit for being able to handle all of that. Uh, it takes a special type of person, not that I'm <laughs> like tooting my horn, but it, it's it's a lot of extra stress and you Mickey don't need. Mickey and I would agree that you're a special person. I, I try to be. Uh, <laughs> I said to his face. <laughs> <laughs> so what about, um, you know, like you're, you're heavily involved in like CAR, which is our Chicago Association of Realtors and stuff like that. Like, have you feel like being involved in the association like helps uh, your career at all? So I never thought about the business aspect of uh, CAR, right? Okay. I mean, truth be told, I met all of my my best friends in the business at YPN, yeah. right? Like, um, I was lucky enough to be a part of your wedding. I was yeah. at your wedding yeah. with some of our other colleagues, yeah. and you just celebrated your anniversary. That's correct. Five five long years, yeah. <laughs> five <laughs> of the best years <laughs> of yeah. your life. Well, I don't mean five long years in a bad way. I just mean, like, it's been, it's been five years. It's crazy to you think. You just like, got like, married what? right in the boom. Yeah. So it was yeah. like, I'm married, yeah. done, it's time for the boom market. Correct, yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, look at how Tommy Choi has like become the president of the association. He has quite the following and he really like leads with gratitude, which Mm -hmm. is such a wonderful mission for him. And it's really like served a purpose for a lot of people because, you know, look, we all represent a different part of the market and there's enough business for everybody. Yeah. And if you think about it, the people that I care the most about really all work for their own shop. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, there's, you were part of what I call the dream team. Of YPN, which I do have to say, I like, think we are the OG, and they'll. It, it's just, it's hard to, it's hard to replicate. Yeah, because I mean, we, we, I mean, the people that we, well, you guys formed the YPN. I came in like nine, ten months after you guys formed it. But I mean, everybody's doing extremely well right now in the business <laughs> aspect, um, and I think that alone has like, and for people who are getting started, I think getting involved with these associations helps because. You know, we've made connections early, and then you all, all kind of come up together. Right. And then, you It's know, like this band of brotherhood. Right. And also, too, that, like, I think what the association does a great job of is, like, again, I don't mean to harp on this education thing, but, like, learning how to do the deal straight up, and learning how to even fill out the paperwork correctly, right. mm. and learning how to, like, you know, submit things properly, or yeah. maybe that whole funny thing called the code of ethics. Right. We adhere to that. Right. I mean, I know I am get, might be getting a little wild in my expectation of other right. agents, but, like, I mean, hey... You know, I mean, we uh, we have a job to it's, do, and I take it really seriously. Yeah, it's tough, though, because real estate's one of those only jobs where you could get your license, and then, like, literally, you're kind of like, what's next? And there's nobody that really tells you what's next. That's I true. I mean, you go, a lot of, some companies have training programs, but let's face it. I mean, when I first got my license, I started in 06 at Century 21 Pro Team. I, my dad actually wouldn't allow me to work for his company, okay, mm. uh, when I first got started. So when I went to Pro Team, there was, like, these... Yeah, eight week training course. And I went there. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna come out of this. I'm gonna know exactly what to do. And like, literally, I probably knew less afterwards. And so it is one of those things that like, how do I do this? What do I do with this? So like, getting a mentor and being on like these boards and stuff like that is good because you know it's nice that like, before I ever did new development, uh, not that I've ever worked it, but like with buyers, my first deal on new development, I called Aaron Mandel up. I was like, hey, what does this actually mean? Right, and because, the developer contracts are usually thirty pages long, right. and there's a uh, you know indemnity information, and there's a warranty, a right. long warranty right. paragraph, and you just want to understand how you're being able to explain, you know, right. X, Y, and Z to your client. So, so being able to have other resources to bounce off of, whether they're competitors or not, is always uh, a good thing to try to because again, you know, getting farther. 
uh, by working together is is always a better resource even at the end of the day like your clients are only winning from this right well I agree so it's 2019 you and I met what, 10 years ago I think it was eight eight or nine one of those two okay it's so it's years. been a, yeah, it's been a hot years. minute yeah so you are what in the city number what uh, we, we we finished number four last number year. four okay yeah. so you're number four we um we are still very tight there's Correct. enough business for everybody in the there's pl- there's, there's billions of dollars of business in Chicago right so we're not starving for business Correct. we can cut the pie any which way Correct. and it gives us an opportunity to really collaborate on best practices so that we can learn how to get to the closing table more effectively and efficiently we learn something new every day cuz every deal is totally different absolutely yeah. and and things change there's always new things that are coming in and and kind of talking about like you know business numbers and where you're going. What about you? Like your business, you've got a team now. You didn't have a team before. True. How, how big is your team that you have now? So I have three gals that work with me full time. Okay. Uh, and uh, the large majority of our purpose is to work on a book of business that I've built over the last X amount of years. And um, I'm not looking to get any bigger. That was going to be my next question. Is I know. You, Matt and you, I fight about this all you, the time. Do you want to get bigger as a team? There's a few things Matt and I fight over. Yeah. Definitely not our appreciation for French wine. Yes. We can agree on that. Yes, we both love French wine. Mm -hmm. One thing we uh, disagree on is that I don't report a lot of my business. Which is like off, she does a lot of off market business. I do. I do a lot. Me and Mickey hate off market business because. Doesn't count. Right. It's all stats. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you are are a numbers guy, you're a stats guy. You like to, I mean, you love being number four. I, I mean, I, you, listen, you just love, like everybody else. You would like else, to be number two. I, I would like to be number no, one, oh, personally. Okay. But yes. I heard first uh, is the worst, second is the best. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yeah. The, yeah I but that. I mean, <laughs> listen, it's, uh, I'm a compa- like, you know, even though, you know, we talk about collaborations better than competition, I still like to compete to but try to get to the But you compete with yourself. So Correct. this is the difference. And like on the record here, on this podcast, I would like yeah. to share for anyone who has misconstrued your competitive nature on any level, right. you are by far only competitive with you. 100%. Like I don't You wake I, up every morning and you think how can Matt Laracy be better? 100 That's exactly right. And I, that I, is I one of the things I love the most about I him. don't not like anybody that's <laughs> above us. I just want to be better than like we finished at 161 million plus last year and I personally see it as a failure cuz I feel like we probably could have got to 200. Right. Well, this so, is why you think, you know, sleeping 9 hours might be a failure because how many deals could you have cranked out in and that 4 five hours? hours when yeah. You're up? I oh mean, it's crazy. Goodness. So, I mean, but I mean, <laughs> not wanting to grow your team is I mean, listen, everybody's got their own agenda in life. Not everybody wants the, you know, the same thing. That's why they make red cars, black cars, blue cars. Everybody's got their own sure. opinion and there's no right or wrong answer. But why do you not report your closings all the time? <laughs> well, there's a few things. Yeah. One is that sometimes I do pocket deals where buyer and seller re- would like to remain anonymous. So there's yeah. a lot of that. She's got cool clients. Number two is that I do a lot of business where I might find the property mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily uh, represented by an entity. And maybe I handle with a corporation and it's just not worth it for me to have them... Uh, join the association whereby, you know, we could record it. Yeah. So for me, in my heart, I know what my business deal is. I know that I look at myself in the mirror every day and I'm like, you did a damn thing. Right. <laughs> you don't need the numbers behind you. That's, I mean, listen, that's good. That, that's a, you know, there's, again, th- there's different ways to look at it. I think I report enough to be in the top 1% because I think that that probably matters to new people right? right so if they say what separates you against our tours you know we've only ever competed once uh this is a true story <laughs> i will never forget this it was on 210 scott <laughs> oh uh, you do remember the uh, address th- this is a true story i don't even know if you know this the, ton- I, the tunnels uh not the tunnels we have now it was a different one okay. and i'll this never was years ago years ago like years ago and i competed uh on this listening consultation i was like man i think that went really well and then i got the news <laughs> that i didn't get it which is like to me devastating. Like losing is like the worst feeling in the world for me. Uh, and then I see, lo and behold, who got the listing? Aaron Frickin' Mendel. And I, I was did. like, damn. And when was this? Oh, oh God. God. This must were have been got, like. Were you on the board together then? Or was it? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, and I remember seeing her and I was just like, I love Aaron, but fuck, do I hate her right and this I think second. And we lived like super yeah. close yeah. together, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah like we had 469 here on We had like, yeah. uh, you know, like walked 
walk and see each other at the gym. Yeah, the gym. He'd be I'm like, like that's lifting weights. That's at the gym, and I'm like, I was like telling her, gym, I'm like, fuck. You got that train. He'd be like yeah. lifting weights and be like, <laughs> and at this time, like, it was really, like, I don't even think we could eat lunch that day because we it's lost that list. Oh, and, and, like, knowing that, like, the bills were falling in on me because I lost this listing, it was, like, the worst feeling in the world. <laughs> so, but, yes, I mean, uh, you know, losing things and, and being able to compete, I, I think that's a good thing, though, too, is, like, um, learning how to, uh, you know, be happy for other people when they uh, win stuff. Because in our business with the ego and stuff like that, I do think that is uh, – like, like I said, I, I hate losing, but at the end of the day, not even Mickey Mantle bad at a thousand. You're gonna lose. You know, the goal is to to win more than you lose. That's the reality is. But I do think it it, it could be better if people were more happier for other people rather than throwing other people in the bus when they lose. So uh, I have a funny um, a funny story about that. So generally speaking, in this marketplace, if right. I'm up against somebody, mm -hmm. it's either gonna be Matt, it's gonna be Tommy, yep, or it's gonna be Newman. Yeah. Okay, so these are my peeps. Right. Okay, so I go in, and we have a nice sphere of influence, right? We all, like, kind of maybe hang out with similar people. We have similar friends from, you know, college or whatever it may right. be. So I think there were, like, two or three cases where I took a little siesta out of the country. Right. And so I remember this one moment when I was in the pool, and I would ordered my first cocktail, and I was so excited to just, like, not be on the phone. Right. And this really nice couple approached me, and they're like, oh, um you know, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Chicago. And what do you do? I sell real estate. And they say, oh, you know, um, uh, we're from Chicago and we just put our home on the market. And I said, oh, wow, who are you working with? And they said, Josh Weinberg. <laughs> that's, I mean, but that's <laughs> and how I small. Said, but do you know what I thought to myself? I thought, thank goodness they're in good hands with a good guy who's going to bring them a thoughtful offer right. and get to the closing table in a really good fashion. But I, I think that kind of goes back to like, trying to get along really well with other brokers too because like honestly like I want to see other people succeed as well you know what I mean like you want to see your friends do well in life I mean you don't want to see somebody like fall behind the you know the ball here and like struggle so it is nice to see competitors technically uh do well and, and being happy for people with the wins and what about like uh, talking about picking up clients and stuff like that how do you how do you get most of your business is it is it marketing or is it pass for clients or do you advertise online or what do you do mostly I am 99.9% .9 repeat and referral. Okay. How do you stay in touch with these referrals? To, to, to And where does the 0.01% come from? <laughs> <laughs> I do a little branding advertising in, okay. uh, in CS Magazine, or I do a okay. little branding advertising. I just partner with Sophisticated Living, which is Alice and Victoria's uh, magazine. So Who's Alice and Victoria? Alice and Victoria is... Um, Should I know her? She does Windy City... Uh, Rehab oh, on HGTV, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. she to me is like uh, the epitome of a uh, of a gal who's just making her way. No, actually, I, I Nicole had the show on uh, two days ago, and I was like, this is actually pretty cool. The I buck, didn't the Bucktown episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. the Bucktown one. I was like, <laughs> I was like, exactly. I think I drove past that place. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so so you do that type of stuff, and that's where the point oh one percent comes from. I would say that people maybe recognize my face or Emily's face or Liz's face or Kate's right. face by you know some of the things that we do, but I'm not specifically targeting an opportunity to gain more business. It's more just brand recognition. Well, first off, uh, the marketing that you do produce. I personally love because I'm more for like clean, simple, but like luxurious look. And I think you do a fantastic job Thank on you. it. So I thought you would get more than 0.01%. Well, hey, uh, you know, I might retain a good amount of business because, you know, people remember my name because of those initiatives. Got it. But the point of that is really brand awareness. And then also reminding the, the public and our community that like really I base my business on integrity. Yeah. And I base my business on a moral compass that, look, as we know, the market's been in a bit of a upswing, uptick, yeah, and also it's been a bit inflated. It has been. So yeah. you get to a point in a multiple offer where you have fifteen people in, and you're representing the buyer, and you know in your brain and in your heart and right. in the comp that the the deal is probably twenty percent above the market. Right. And I look at my buyers and I say, "You're going to have to stay in this home for ten years right. to see it." And if you don't. You're in trouble. Yeah, we say so like are you you're willing, buying it for you. Are like you, you willing? Have to know that. Are you willing to to move forward as such? Right. And if they say yes, then I think I've done my job right. in explaining to them what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but that's something that's really important to me. Yeah. So, like, what about staying in touch with past clients? Do you do like uh, events? Do you do cards, newsletters? Like, how do you do that? 
I think it's really organic. So yeah. um, I do send a letter mm-hmm. every, you know, on their sales anniversary. Yeah. Um, I got your Christmas card. It was amazing, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. We like to donate uh, something local in Chicago. Oh, I like to awesome. really represent like Chicago local something, right? Okay. So at uh, the broker open that I had at yeah. Arlington, yeah. we had Koval represented yeah. because that's a local distillery. We worked with a caterer that's local. We really like to bring in people that support Chicago small business. Yeah, that's awesome. And then what about, so like, what about like downtime? Like, what do you do? How do you shut down? And what's your favorite thing to do in your downtime? What is downtime? So, so what's that? It's 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 the time when you're not working. Yeah, I not guess, working. Yes. Do you have downtime? Have do you believe in a, balance? I'm gonna give a solid thought. I'm just kidding. So the biggest thing that I like to do is, um, so music really is my biggest passion, right? So I think to me, music is church. So yeah. when I go to a show, it's really the first and only time um, I'm able to really like check out. Right. A valuable lesson I learned only this year, and I've been in the business yeah. for quite some time here, um, that nothing catastrophic is going to happen in one hour. Yeah. I'm like, Aaron, it's just real estate. Right. It just, it's, it, it, you're not going to miss anything in that short period. I mean, how many emails do you get a day? 2,500 on Okay, average. so yeah. I'm around, I, I'm around that number. Yeah. Um, and I would say that, you know, one person on my team, she helps me get through my email right. a day, and she flags a really important one. So the minute I go into that concert, I'm like, I only have 45 oranges. Right. So that's 45 action items that I need to reply to right. after this one hour of freedom. Right. <laughs> so... <laughs> Going off of those emails, you're able to shut down for those couple hours, and that's probably like your favorite time to kind of like, you know, kind of be able to recharge your batteries. Right. Well, to me, music is really personal, and music yeah. is really like an opportunity for me to like see how an artist might express themselves or how they see uh, life through their lens, and it's such a different thing than what we do, right? Because right. we're like on the grind, on the ground, Always. talking to people, speaking. And it's just like that one time where I'm like, nobody cares about me. Nobody wants me for right, anything. Right, right, right. There's no leak. There's no question of which grade to put on my wall. I mean, I just get just an hour to uh, enjoy the music. That's good. A little shutdown time. So before we go here, we have what we call the Fast Five, where the co-host, Mr. Mickey Hobson here, is going to ask you five quick questions. Okay. Mickey? You ready? I'm ready. Uh, best piece of advice you ever received? That reputation is everything. That's good. That's good. That's yep. good piece of advice. I agree with that. Uh, do you love to win or hate to lose? And there is a correct answer to this. That technically, yes. And I got it right, and he got it wrong. Yeah. I hate to lose. There we go. Okay. See, you got it wrong. Again. And why do you hate to lose? <laughs> because who, who hates? Nobody likes to lose, man. I mean, according to the corporate America and Nikki Hobson. Uh, are we? Are we in corporate to, America? You're supposed to love to win. Why? Uh, what is the right answer? Why? You don't even know, do you? Because most people said that. Yeah. Oh, well. The, <laughs> I don't know. Well, honestly. so this is what it's separates us, Matt. This yeah. is what yeah. separates yeah. us yeah. from corporate America. Yeah, exactly. Ryan Suhan said he loves to win. Oh. He did. Okay. okay. That was well, his answer. Okay. Um, who is your biggest hero? My dad. That's good. Yeah. Uh, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Mm. Do you watch X-Men? I do, but not okay. like you guys. Oh, we're big fans. Yeah, I, always I know. I know. Yeah. This is a Marvel. This is a Marvel office. Yeah. A superpower. Not a DC office. Yeah, we don't you know, like DC. Th- yeah. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Good to know. Just building the parameter there. Yeah. Superpower. I suppose sometimes I wish that I had an ability not to worry so much. Okay. I think that my superpower would be that I would be able to like be in it, take care of yeah. it, and then turn it off and not worry so much. So pretty much emotionless. Um, no, I don't wish that. <laughs> but I do think that I have, um, I care so much. I care so much about the deal. I care so yeah. much about my client. I care so much about the transaction that I've really tried to work so hard and being able you to, like to turn off. separate yeah. myself. Yeah. Yep. And lastly, what makes you Chicago? Mm, am I Chicago? Even though you're from Milwaukee. I am from Milwaukee. I've had a tough year in sports. Yeah. Tough. Tough, and the Bears are doing well, Bears such a good job. Yeah. You think they're going to win? I mean, I don't think. Did I hear win. it here first? I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'll back it. Okay, I think they will win mm-hmm. personally because I hate all the other teams. But uh, it's more of an emotional response. Okay, so I think what makes me Chicago is uh, I would say in this particular location, I probably know every building. I know all the peeps at the door. 
I know the maintenance peeps. I know everybody in these buildings inside and out, and I know all the stacks, right? So right. I know all the tiers, all the buildings, all the comps. Um, yeah. I feel very confident in my ability to guide people in the right to, in the right. To, and I also know my niche. Yeah. So and I don't so travel outside of it. Yeah. So where can people find you, and what would you want to plug? Mm. I got nothing to plug. No Aaron Mandel dot something? Oh, you can find me at AaronMandel.com, but really you can just find me. Facebook, Instagram. Mm, oh, yeah. I think I have some of that, too. I'm like the opposite of you, aren't you I? Snapchat as well? Um, I do have a Snapchat. I don't use it very often. Uh, okay. You use a Snapchat anymore. I mean, people Snapchat. You use a Snapchat uh, yeah, like when you went to Target the other day, I noticed. I, I did, yeah. I, that See? was hilarious. Yeah, that was... But mostly I enjoyed Nicole's reactions the most. I mean... I really look for Nicole's what, reactions. Was that planted, though? I think it was planted. No, uh, we, like, literally <laughs> walked up the car. I've never go to Target. For everybody out there, really quickly, we went to Target. I, I've never been to Target because Nicole, like, my wife loves going to Target. And she's like, I want some orange juice. She's pregnant. She's feeding orange juice. She's like, will you come with me? It's 8 o'clock at night, okay? New Year's Day. I'm like, sure, I'll go with you. And five minutes, we come in, we come out, and there is a condom on my windshield. And I looked at Maybe Nicole, somebody like, was trying to tell was, you safety first. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I was like, was this yeah. experience worth this? You I know? mean, I think she and probably she, thoroughly enjoyed the She was juice. dying, yeah. She, she, yeah. And her belly laugh was yeah. just like, I mean, she was like legitimately belly laughing. She was like, the orange juice tastes much better than you experienced at a Target. So, Especially because you're, you're one of the more appropriate people I know. You must have been horrified. I, I was just like, I can't believe this has happened. But anyways, so make sure to tune into our next episode. Subscribe to our podcast. Like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening to the Matt Literacy Project.